Welcome to Prime Nine, the countdown show that covers the very best in baseball. Guaranteed to start arguments, not end them. This week, it's the nine best broadcasters in baseball history. Why nine? That's baseball. Nine players, nine innings. Prime Nine. Ever since the radio first appeared in living rooms, the sounds of the game have been delivered to us by countless men behind the mic. And so, ladies and gentlemen, another October has rolled around, and with it, another World Series. Ready for play ball. And with the advent of television, that number has more than doubled. Hi, everybody. I'm Vin Scully. Hi, everybody. I'm Keith Jackson. So how did we pick the nine greatest broadcasters of all time? Oh, they had to have made their name as an announcer for one specific team. And they had to have done so for a number of years. That's why you won't find great national names like Bob Costas, Tony Kubek, or Joe Gargiola on this list. Some of our top nine spoke sparingly. Some never stopped. Oh, we are live. <laughs> Some created catchphrases. How about that? Others are famous for iconic calls. But they all painted a picture of the game on the field and delivered it beautifully to our ears. So let's tune in to the nine greatest baseball broadcasters of all time. Beginning with number nine on Prime Nine. Hi everybody, I'm Kurt Gowdy. For 15 years in the 50s and 60s, Kurt Gowdy's voice filled the airwaves of New England. Kurt Gowdy became as associated with a city and region as any broadcaster ever has during his time in Boston. Red Sox fans have had a long winter's wait, and they're always eager to be at Fenway for opening day. He became a symbol of the Red Sox. The fans all over New England embraced Kurt Gowdy for his knowledge and his expertise as an announcer. Another season is underway at Fenway Park as our Red Sox break onto the field. Kurt Gowdy was a god in the household I grew up in in central Massachusetts. He was the voice of the Red Sox. The Red Sox weren't very good in the early 60s, but Kurt was the best broadcaster. In 1965, Kurt's audience grew even larger when he made the transition to NBC and earned national acclaim. America remembers him for doing baseball on NBC. Hi, everybody. I'm Kurt Gowdy of NBC Sports. Gowdy did virtually every game of the week. He did every World Series. He did Reggie Jackson's Titanic home run at Tiger Stadium. It is off the roof. That hit the transformer up there. He did the Mets in 1969. The Mets are the world champions. Kurt went on to call everything from Super Bowls to Final Fours. But his first love was baseball. And the legacy that began in Boston grew only greater throughout the years. If you heard his voice on your television, you knew it was a game that you had to watch. Those voices that cut through everything else that's hitting people on a nightly or daily basis, that's special. And Kirk Gowdy was one of those voices. Welcome to New York Yankee Baseball. I'm Bill White. <laughs> Wait a minute. Oh, and I swear to God I didn't. If you tuned into a game in which Phil Rizzuto was broadcasting and you were interested in following the game... Oh, that's gone. You were in for disappointment. No, it's not. Close. Off the wall. <laughs> I loved Phil. He had more fun and never took himself seriously. That was what's so great about him. This hat is making me a little lopsided tonight. You would listen because Rizzuto was so engaging. Phil became, in a sense, uh, larger than the game. Scooter was a fan favorite with the Yankees, and those same fans embraced his offbeat style in the booth. Got him! Whoop! Holy <laughs> God! For Phil was both a broadcaster and an entertainer. The game was incidental to the cannoli delivery. There's the cannolis. Cannolis, birthdays. I fly and while it's in the air, happy birthday to Daphne Lafazan. He's always talking about getting out of there quick. I'll be home in a while, Gore. <laughs> Whatever it was, we all accepted that and we loved that. He said I'd be in the Hall of Fame one day and I'm going in. And he went into the hall as a player with the same stream of consciousness approach he employed so effectively behind the mic. One of these flies. I've got to mention. I've got to get these flies on here. As usual. 
classic risotto. This is it. Oh, no, wait a minute. I, got... <laughs> I forgot my whole career as an announcer. <laughs> I don't know. Absolutely the best. With undeniable energy and charm, Scooter brought a style to baseball broadcasts that no one has ever matched, and it's doubtful that anyone ever will. He just had a style all his own, and that's what endeared him, I'm sure, to the many people that followed his broadcasts. Welcome back to Prime Nine, featuring the nine best baseball broadcasters. We've made our case for nine and eight, which means it's time for number seven. I think if fans like me, it's because they can vision themselves doing the game exactly the way I do it. A voice of the Cardinals, A's, and White Sox before becoming a fixture at Wrigley Field, Harry Carey brought an everyman approach to the booth that fans identified with. He was the ultimate fan's voice. The fan was watching the game or listening to it and frustrated. You can bet Harry was doing the same thing. God, how could you swing at a pitch that far? What was special about Harry Carey, he was a great broadcaster, but he was a fan. And that meant so much to the fans. No matter where he went, everybody wanted to be around Harry. The big fans of yours in Oklahoma. Not many broadcasters lead their fans in song, but Harry turned the seventh inning stretch in Chicago into a musical tradition. just a great moment in every game when he leaned out of the booth and did his thing. They couldn't wait to stand up and look forward to hearing him. There Harry was, and in the seventh inning stretch, he resurrected, in essence, taking me out to the ball game and made it the game's anthem. Harry broadcast games for more than half a century, but it was his last 16 years with the Cubs when he went beyond the game and became a folk hero. Harry Carey almost dwarfed the Ivy, Wrigley Field. He became the greatest ambassador that any team has ever had. As the epitome of Harry Carey was with the Chicago Cubs, I think Harry Callis is with the Philadelphia Phillies. Well hit to deep center field. This ball's out of here. I've always been taught a broadcaster kind of paints the picture. Swing and a drive to right field. John Stone, a long run, makes the running catch nicely. I think Harry does a great job of painting that picture and telling the story. Harry had an intriguing baseball style. There wasn't a lot of storytelling, but with that magnificent baritone, who cared? At Burrell, the batter, he's hitting at 272. He has good career numbers against Chile. Harry the K's voice resonated with both Phillies fans and players for 39 years. He had a style that was often imitated, but never duplicated. Swing it all. I would never try to imitate Harry Callis. Let me see, let me try and dig deep. This ball is hit deep left. This ball is out of here. Number 58 for, for the, the big, big man. man. <laughs> Harry was indeed the voice of summer in Philadelphia, but he was so much more. He was a fan friendly guy. He was always shaking hands. He was always available for the fan. He would lend his voice when people wanted voice recordings. Brad's not here to take your call right now. Harry Callis really became part of the larger Phillies clubhouse. He has Honored by the Hall of Fame in 2002, Harry Callis will forever be missed in the city of brotherly love, but he will never be forgotten. Harry is the kind of announcer, like an Allen, like a Harwell, Someone may succeed him, no one will replace him. Welcome back to Prime Nine, 
featuring the best baseball broadcasters in the history of the game. Kurt Gowdy checked in at number nine, followed by the scooter, Phil Rizzuto. Then came a pair of honorable Harrys, Carey and Callis, which means it's time for number five. It's Tiger Stadium, the most famous corner in the Midwest, and we're glad to have you with us. When you think of the Detroit Tigers, you think of Ernie Harwell. He came right through that radio, telling those beautiful stories about the early days of the game of baseball. The Tigers had a manager named Huey Jennings who coached at third base. He used to yell out, yee-haw, all the time. It got to be a famous cry for him. Perhaps the nicest man in more than a century of big league baseball, Ernie Harwell used his southern charm to become a Midwest icon. There's a swing of the ground ball at wide of third, deep at short. Here's the warning throw to first, not in time. You could sit and listen to him all day. Tony Clark beats it out, and that is the first hit of the It game. doesn't get too much better than, uh, than Mr. Harwell. He said, well, you know, we grew up without radio and television. And we grew up on the front porch. And that anecdotal ambiance, he said, was perfect for the game. He's got red hair and a red beard and a great big smile. He would say of a double play, two for the price of one of the Tigers winning. And of course, he would say of a batter who took a call, third strike. He stood there like a house on the side of the road. Strike called, he stood there like the house by the side of the road. For more than 40 years, fans had the privilege of hearing Ernie call unforgettable moments in Tiger history. And it's all over. The Tigers have won their first tennis since 1945. Let's listen to the bedlam here at Tiger Stadium. He swings as a long. And when Ernie had his day in Cooperstown in 81, his self-penned poem, What is Baseball?, made for a classy and classic acceptance speech. Baseball is a tongue-tied kid from Georgia growing up to be an announcer. This is a game for America. Still a game for America, this baseball. Thank you. Swing and a long one to right field. He really cracked it way back at the wall. Adios! Jack Buck was the patron saint of Cardinals Nation. He did the Cardinals from 1954 through 2002, and he became the heart and soul of very possibly the most fanatical fandom of any team in the land. Here's the pinch, and it's a strike called! A no hitter for Gibson! Jack Buck's ability to connect to people was the greatest tool that he had. Two balls and a strike to Van Slyke. I think everybody thought that Jack Buck was announcing to them personally. That sense that the broadcaster isn't just a skilled craftsman, he's a friend of yours. Jack Buck really had that. I'll be done. And of course, when he got on the national stage, he had some of the most dramatic goosebump raising calls of big moments. Smith, Corks went into right down the line. It may go! Go crazy, folks, go crazy. Go crazy, folks, go crazy! The Cardinals have won the game by a score of three to two on a home run by the Wizard. Go, go crazy. crazy. Gibson swings and a fly ball to deep right field. This is gonna be a home run, unbelievable! I don't believe what I just saw. One thing that my dad always said was, the worst you can do is try and plan out what you're going to say. Into deep left center for Mitchell, and we'll see you tomorrow night. And we'll see you tomorrow night. What all those calls represent, they just appropriately describe how he was feeling at that moment. I don't know about you, but as for me, the question has already been answered. Should we be here? Yes. And I think if he was feeling it, because he was such a big baseball fan, baseball fans everywhere who he was talking to probably felt the same way. And that's a winner for the Cardinals. Howdy, folks. This is Red Barber. Walter Lanier Barber was known for both the color of his hair and his colorful ability to turn a phrase. Ball game in this series, just as tight as a brand new pair of shoes on a rainy day. In a time when radio was king, Red Barber was the king of radio. 
People who remember baseball in Brooklyn in the 40s and early 50s when Red was the voice of the Dodgers have told me that it was possible to walk down a street in Brooklyn without a radio and never miss a pitch. Cresetti swings on it. It's a line drive deep out into center field. Harry Kraft is on his mule going back, and he pulls it down. The entire borough was glued to the Dodgers. Well, the Duke is tearing up the pee pad. And all these D's, Dems, and Do's Brooklynites were seeing it through the eyes of a literate, refined, and elegant broadcaster from the South. Ebbets Field, yes sir, where there's never a dull day. Red began broadcasting Dodger games in 1939, and his most memorable moment took place eight years later, when he deftly helped Jackie Robinson break the color barrier. No question, that was the hottest microphone that any announcer ever had to face. And all I did was to report Robinson, not that he was black or anything else. I reported him as another ball player and a very exciting ball player. Bunt, might be trouble. So Robinson bunts to the pitcher and bunts it so neatly that he moves not at a second, puts himself on at first, and low fat does not even throw. It's been said that my broadcast was highly instrumental in soothing the emotions and having people really just look at Robinson as this exciting ball player, and when he got on base, the most exciting I ever saw. It was a great World Series. Our congratulations go to both ball clubs, and especially to the again champions of the world, the New York Yankees. Although Red switched Burroughs in 54 to join Mel Allen in the Yankees booth for the next 13 years, he will forever be known as the voice of the Brooklyn Dodgers, Vin Scully's mentor, and an inspiration to all who followed in his footsteps. Red Barber had a significant influence on an entire generation of broadcasters. There was something in him for everyone. And that is why in the 1940s, he was without question the preeminent announcer in the game. We now return to Prime Nine, where this week we're featuring the greatest broadcasters in the history of the game. Keep in mind that they had to have made their name with one specific team, and for quite a number of years. So now it's time for number one and two, the best voices ever to broadcast a baseball game. We begin with number two. Good afternoon, baseball fans. This is Mel Allen. It's fairly cool today. It's top coat weather. But you can be sure that as far as those men on the diamond are concerned, it's mighty hot. Mel Allen is one of the very greatest baseball announcers. He had one of the most important qualities, a distinctive and listenable voice. And that ball is going, going, and it is gone. Roger Maris gets his first hit of the series. When Mel Allen announced his first Yankee game in 1939, a legend was born. No more baseball after today. This is it. Every pitch is it. For six decades, Mel wrote the book of baseball in the Bronx with his words. Ladies and gentlemen, the Bambino, Babe Ruth. One of the all-time Yankee greats, Mickey Mantle. A new hitter, a new hitter for Dave McGinney. When you listen to Mel Allen on a broadcast, you enjoyed it, period. Mel's popularity and influence transcended the game. Catchphrases that the voice of the Yankees made popular in the 40s still resonate today. How about that? How about that play? How about that? There was something about Mel's voice that was unmistakable. Variety magazine had a poll in the 1950s of the 25 most recognizable voices in the world. Eisenhower made the list, De Gaulle made the list, Churchill made the list, Mel Allen made the list. He was the ultimate broadcast celebrity. I got off of a plane one day, got into a cab, and all I did was say, uh, the Sheridan, please, and his head went around on a swivel. Mel's voice and fame reached a whole new generation of fans starting in the late 70s, when he signed on to be the narrator of a brand new show about the game he loved. Hello there, everybody. This is Mel Allen. Welcome to This Week in Baseball. 
The fact that Major League Baseball decided to hire him to be their first host was a brilliant decision. Don't worry, be happy. Opening days all on This Week in Baseball. Can you name the major? He didn't simply do that show, he became that show. That little ad lib got in there. Yeah, I think it's I'm yeah. fine. Boy, it's fine. Well, did it fit? And because of him, his cachet, it became very quickly the highest rated syndicated series of sport in television history. When Mel passed away in 96, the flags at Yankee Stadium flew at half-mast. Mel's voice had been silenced, but his legacy lives on. So many people say, I grew up with you. And my answer is, I grew up with you too. No announcer in any sport has had the impact that Vin Scully has had. She is gone! He is the voice of baseball, the soundtrack of summer. Ruby hit a bullet for a base. But it's every baseball game you've ever heard or seen or remembered. It's two and two to Harvey Keene. Two and two to Harvey Keene. One strike away. Swung on and missed a perfect game. In 1950, at the age of 22, Vin Scully joined the Dodgers. On this day in 1945, the St. Louis Browns... 60 years and some 10,000 Dodger games later, he's still in their broadcast booth. And that is... Oh, unbelievable! What Vinny does seems to be magical from a standpoint, not only putting you on the field where you can smell the grass, you can feel the dirt under your feet. Yeah, we're all with you, Noli, huffing and puffing now. But he relays it in a manner that is user-friendly. Fernando Valenzuela has pitched a no-hitter. If you have a sombrero, throw it to the sky. Scully's smooth as silk voice has also often been heard on the national stage. He's done a non-parallel 25 World Series. Behind the bag, it gets through Buckner. Here comes Knight, and the Mets win it. He's done 18 no-hitters. Nothing scratchy, nothing fluky. It was a masterpiece. You think Lasorda has a lot of stories? I guarantee you Vin's got more stories than Lasorda does. I don't get to hear Vinny as much as everyone else, so when you see me getting thrown out of a ball game, it's only because I want to go into the clubhouse <laughs> and find out if he can still do the job. <laughs> getting the job that I love at a young age and able to do it all these years and still be doing it now, there's only one feeling that you have, and that is overwhelming thanks that you've been given that opportunity. What a sweet, beautiful moment. I don't think anybody calls a game the way Vin Scully does. I mean, he's everything you want in a baseball announcer, and he's an institution. Good night, everybody. Since this episode is all about the voices of the game, let's listen one more time to Mr. Vin Scully doing what he does best. On the scoreboard in right field, it is 9.46 p.m. in the city of the Angels, Los Angeles, California. And Sandy Koufax, whose name will always remind you of strikeouts, did it with a flourish. As did all of these magnificent men behind the mic. That's our Prime Nine. What's yours? <laughs>